Okay. Is this mic on? It sounds like it is. Good morning, everybody. I ask you to, uh, those of you who are still gathering, um, take your seats. Uh, good morning, and thank you for attending our uh, cybersecurity conference for lawyers. Uh, I'm Steve Funnell. I'm the general counsel for the Department of Homeland Security, and I'm your kind of intermittent MC and uh, one of your co-hosts, I guess, is a way uh, of this event. I want to emphasize um, the fact that this is a joint uh, event between the Homeland Security Department and the Justice Department. I think the symbolism of that is important. Uh, we are working together um, uh, across the, the interagency, in particular uh, DOJ and DHS, who, who work together so much in this space. Um, this is the first uh, conference of its kind, um, and uh, we've had a, a, a turnout that far exceeds the capacity or an interest level that far exceeds the capacity of this room. So all of you in this room should consider yourselves very special. And that uh, you know, hopefully we'll, the the demand and the length of the waiting list is uh, an indication that we we will be doing this again in the future, uh, and someday you can tell your grandchildren that you were at the first one. Um, so uh, why are we doing this now? Um, I, I think there, there are a number of reasons, but uh, I mean one is that lawyers in particular are playing an increasing role in how companies deal with cyber-related issues from incident response uh, to protecting networks. Um, of course, not every lawyer has a, a deep technical background or experience to know how to deal effectively with some of the, the nuanced and complicated issues uh, that arise in the cyber area. Um, and, and this means that training and education um, within the bar, whether you're an in-house lawyer or, an, or a lawyer at a law firm, uh, it is, is extremely important. And in fact, one of the priorities uh, that I set for the Office of General Counsel within the Homeland Security Department this year was to lift the cyber literacy of all 2,000 lawyers in the department uh, across the country, uh, not just the, the sort of cyber experts, but everybody. Uh, because it's, it, the technology and the cybersecurity issues related to it um, are, uh, are inextricably intertwined in, in pretty much every aspect of what we do, and that will be increasingly true as we go forward. In fact, there was an article just the other day in the Washington Post about how the government is finding it hard to, fi to hire smart and experienced lawyers with technical expertise. And I, I venture to guess that that's a challenge in the private sector as well. Um, so all of which is a long way of saying congratulations for making a good choice to be here today because hopefully it will lift your, your expertise a little bit and, and help you uh, be a messenger for uh, sort of proselytizing that to, uh, to the, the broader uh, legal profession. So what we're going to do today um, uh, is explore some of the, the key issues that we see uh, emerging, especially in the wake of, of new statutory authorities, a new presidential policy directive, uh, and, and the, the way those new authorities and new policies are going to implicate the, the public-private partnership, which is really the foundation of the, the national strategy in this space. Um, so we're going we're gonna to have a panel that will be talking about PPD 41, which is the new presidential policy directive on uh, coordination in, in uh, response to significant uh, cyber incidents. Um, we will, and that's, that's almost hot off the presses still. Uh, that was at the end of July that that came out. Um, we're also going to uh, talk about information sharing, uh, and you will get a, a demonstration during the lunch hour of our automated information sharing system, uh, which I think you'll find very interesting. Um, and, and then we'll, we will also have uh, a panel uh, sort of from the perspective of, of in-house counsel and uh, how they see uh, the impediments uh, perhaps uh, that may still remain to some kinds of information sharing. And you know, ha we want to have a conversation about the value proposition because we really believe that that is key uh, to, to dealing with what is essentially a collective action challenge for the country. Uh, and then um, finally, we'll, we'll have a panel of regulators who you know, uh, share some thoughts with you on the regulatory perspective in this space, which I think is, a, is an exciting and evolving area. Um, 
let me, uh, let me talk about a few logistics. Um, we, want, uh, we want this to be interactive. Um, the choice of this somewhat informal space was not uh, accidental. We want to promote discussion not, among, not just amongst you guys at the tables, but uh, collectively as a group. At, at, on each of your tables, you will find note cards. And throughout the day, we encourage you to write out any questions that you may have as you're listening to the panelists. Um, and uh, hopefully we will, we will have folks come around and collect those cards during the discussion and, and hopefully we'll have a chance to have the panelists address uh, uh, many of them. And, uh, and if there's insufficient time, we'll, we'll provide them uh, to the moderator and uh, hopefully work them into the Q&A uh, session at the end of the day. Um, we will have mics uh, around the room to help with all of that. Uh, in addition, uh, keep in mind if you're on the mic that this conference is also being live streamed. Um, and uh, not only does that mean what you say will be live streamed, but it means if you miss any part of the conference, uh, the live stream is available later. You can download it. Um, and it will, uh, we will also, uh, also be, uh, uh, for those of you who are Twitter users, uh, there's a hashtag for this event, which is hashtag DHSDOJCyber. Um, and, and, and finally, let me, uh, let me make sure I recognize a few of the, the many folks that contributed to, to putting this together. And, and uh, um, uh, the, I think the biggest uh, expression of thanks and appreciation goes to the Wilson Center, which is hosting this. Uh, I, I'd like to, uh, in particular, thank Jane Harmon, who is not only the CEO of the Wilson Center, but also a, a great friend of DHS. Um, and I'd like to, uh, in particular, single out Meg King, as well as the rest of the wonderful Wilson Center team. Uh, they really collectively went above and beyond uh, in helping us uh, plan this event, and, um, and uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, um, and as I mentioned, this is a co-sponsored conference between DHS and DOJ. There are lots of people within both of those organizations that contributed to the brainstorming, the planning, and uh, the administrative logistics that, that went into pulling this off. Uh, I, I do want to uh, particularly single out Kieran Raj, who's one of, uh, one of my deputy general counsels, who was really uh, uh, the person more than anybody who kind of conceived of this and uh, has really uh, been sort of the thought leader on planning it. Uh, and then in particular, uh, two other folks, uh, by no means an exhaustive list, but two, two folks who really uh, bear special mention. One is my special assistant, uh, Donya Hadamalamum, who uh, I don't think realized that she was going to be an event planner as well as all their other duties when she signed on. And, and uh, Donya, really appreciate all that you did uh, to organize this. And then Matt Kaczynski, also from DHS, who is a, a master of all things logistical, uh, including things like mics. And, and uh, we really appreciate the help in that regard from all of you. So let me ask you just a round of applause for all the folks who planned this. Okay, um, unless I'm forgetting any key logistics, uh, I now want to uh, turn to introducing our first uh, event, our first speaker, and it's, it's really a great pleasure for me personally and, and on behalf of the department to introduce uh, the Deputy Secretary of the Homeland Security Department, Alejandro Mayorkas. Uh, Ali was, uh, was sworn in as the Deputy Secretary of the Homeland Security Department uh, in December of 2013. Um, he has the daunting task of being the number two in command of a department with $60 billion in budget, a workforce of over 240,000 individuals throughout the world, and a portfolio of missions which um, can keep you busy uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, prior to becoming the Deputy Secretary, uh, Ali served as the Director of the Department's United States Citizenship and Immigration Services Agency. USCIS, um, and he has led um, many of the uh, key immigration um, reforms and enhancements uh, over the last uh, seven and a half years. Um, and going back uh, to his pre-DHS life, uh, he was a partner at the law firm of O'Melveny and Myers and a, a very distinguished practitioner in the bar. In fact, he was named one of the 50 most influential minority lawyers in America. 
So he has seen the world from the perspective of private practice from uh, in-house lawyers. Uh, he's also uh, a former U.S. attorney in Los Angeles. He understands the law enforcement world. Um, and just on top of everything else, uh, those of you who know Ali know that he is he's just a remarkable public servant uh, in the best tradition of, of service and, and, and uh, the best tradition of this country. Um, in the cyber area, he has proven to be a remarkably quick study uh, and has really become a real leader within the department, within the administration generally on taking the cyber area, the cyber policy framework uh, to the next level. Um, and I will say personally that he is a wonderful client. Uh, you know, sometimes lawyers are hard clients. Um, he is the exception to that uh, rule and just a terrific colleague. And I'd ask you to join me in giving him a warm welcome. It's easy to be a, a good client when you have a great lawyer. And uh, uh, that has been my privilege. In, uh, having a, a dear friend of mine, Steve Bunnell, um, uh, be a colleague for quite a number of years. Um, I just wanted to share a, a few thoughts that I think will be um, explored in greater detail as the, day, as the day proceeds. And I wanted to start with a little bit of a, an anecdote. I, um, not this uh, most recent summer, but uh, the summer before, I had the opportunity to, um, to provide remarks at DEF CON. I don't know how many of you have uh, attended DEF CON, but it's the conference of hackers, uh, and it was held in Las Vegas. There are about 20,000 people uh, who attend the conference. And when I say uh, a conference of hackers, I mean uh, hackers um, with black, gray, or white hats. And um, white hat is a, a hacker who uh, identifies a vulnerability and actually shares it, sometimes for profit, sometimes uh, just for good. Uh, with uh, the individual or entity who has the vulnerability so that that vulnerability can be patched. The black hat uh, hacker uh, does the same thing with respect to the hack, but uh, obviously for nefarious purposes, and the gray is um, somewhere in between. Uh, perhaps he or she does not yet know, or it could be situational, or we ourselves uh, in enforcement and the government don't know. So I was warned as I was walking into the hotel in Las Vegas that I could not bring uh, my electronic devices. I could not bring my work phone uh, nor my personal phone because they would be hacked. And I, it was at the, uh, at the uh, onset of my accumulation of knowledge in the cyber arena. So I said, well, I'll just turn them off and I'll be okay. And they said, no, you really don't understand. It, it's not a question of whether they're powered on or off. You just can't bring them. So um, I, I adhere to the guidance I received, uh, but I did have something on me. And I spoke to about, about 1,000 people. It was a very different audience than the one before me this morning, uh, uh, both in professional orientation as well as in attire. Uh, and. Um, <laughs> And um, I started my remarks by saying, look, I was told I couldn't bring my, my phone devices with me. I find that hard to believe. I, I do have a phone with me, and I'll pay anyone $1,000 if they can make my phone ring while I am actually addressing all of you. And all of a sudden, the backpacks and briefcases were, fly <laughs> were, were flying open. Uh, equipment was being taken out, and people were starting, starting to work on actually trying to hack the device that I had in my possession. They did not know then, they later learned that what I had was a Motorola flip phone from the 70s that was <laughs> inoperable, but it was quite eye-opening for me. And shortly after my remarks to about a thousand people, two uh, young men addressed about 5,000 uh, people and explained how they hacked into a Chrysler automobile and took over operation of the vehicles through the technology system that Chrysler uh, was touting as really an innovative uh, advancement uh, in the, you know, the uh, motor vehicle industry. Which is a circuitous way of saying uh, how I came to the conclusion 
that um, they're getting in. They're just going to get in. The question is uh, who the they uh, is, uh, which means how difficult can you make it? Uh, how much energy will they need to um, exhaust? Uh, how much time will it take? And how good do they have to be? But if they're the best, if they're the best, and you give them the time, and they have the energy, they're going to come in. And um, there's so much that you can do on your own. And then I think it is incumbent upon us to do certain things together. Because while it may not necessarily benefit the individual or the entity today, um, from a cyber ecosystem perspective, we have to think of the long game because it's a very dynamic and rapidly evolving game. And the one thing, and, we'll, and you'll hear about this in, in detail later, but when I say we have to do something together, what I really mean to suggest is the sharing of information. If a company thinks or an individual thinks that he or she or it uh, can protect itself alone, um, I think it is um, really fundamentally not understanding um, the, the cyber security world as it is today and certainly uh, the direction in which it is headed. And there's something unique about cyber crime, um, uh, whether it's for profit, whether it's a state actor or otherwise. And that is um, the, um, the accessibility of replication of harm. You know, when I was a federal prosecutor, Steve and I uh, shared that foundation together. We both uh, served in the Department of Justice uh, for many years. When I was a prosecutor handling a, a fraud case or, or something simple uh, like a bank robbery, if, if the perpetrator wanted to commit the crime um, again, uh, victimizing a, a different entity or individual, it, was a, it could be a rather laborious uh, enterprise. Here, in, in the cyber world, it's a click of a button. You hit one company, you click the button, you hit another. And if company A, get, who gets uh, hit first, has the, um, the capacity, uh, not just in terms of ability, but actually in terms of mindset, in terms of orientation, to share with company B what happened and how it happened, to share the cyber threat indicator, then company B is protected from um, suffering the very same harm that company A uh, suffered. And the replication is thwarted. And if we collectively do that enough, um, the, 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 um, the wall, if you will, uh, not the wall of immigration, but the wall of cybersecurity, it's a figurative wall, um, uh, is built uh, a bit higher and a built, uh, built stronger and uh, becomes a bit more impenetrable and the community as a whole is safer and more secure. And what we seek in the Department of Homeland Security, what we seek in the Department of Justice, uh, uh, by and through primarily the Federal Bureau of Investigation, is to be participants in that community of information sharing. Because we do think that we have a unique capability. Uh, we have a unique capability uh, to collect and to disseminate, to really be the host uh, of a great deal of information, and we have the capacity to disseminate it broadly and, and thereby uh, build an even stronger wall. We also have a unique capacity in receiving classified information, declassifying it, and disseminating it as well. And so this is one world that w if you go it alone, you really proceed, I think, at, at greater peril. And when you communicate uh, with the government, the government is going to have to decide how to respond uh, to you. And that is a multifaceted question. For the Department of Homeland Security and for the FBI, under president, the new presidential policy directive, and you're going to hear about it quite a bit, we're going to have to decide what our prioritization of response protocols is going to be. When, when company A calls us and says we have suffered an attack and here's how 
uh, we believe it occurred. And if you don't know, we actually can help. Uh, we have that uh, capability. We're going to have to decide whether the traditional regime of accountability is going to control or whether we're going to have to pivot and um, uh, address what we call in the PPD, the Presidential Policy Directive, the asset response. Are we going to try to find out who did it and try to capture them? And we have to recognize, as I learned uh, at DEF CON, that the individual perpetrator may actually be wearing pajamas in the basement of his or her parents' house uh, you know, across an ocean and therefore, quite frankly, not accessible to us from an accountability perspective, at least not today, maybe, maybe someday. Will we seek to uh, hold the perpetrator accountable? Or actually, is our focus going to be on protecting the assets of the company and the ecosystem as a whole? Will we actually uh, try to identify uh, the vulnerability if the company is not already aware of it? Will we assist the company in patching the vulnerability? And will we very quickly disseminate the information we learn, stripped of personally identifiable information and, um, and safeguarding other privacy interests? Because in the investigative arena, the dissemination of uh, information uh, that one learns in the investigation is not the customary protocol. But it may be more important um, uh, to protect the asset of the company and protect the assets that have not yet been exploited. And that is really the architecture and the analytic framework that PPD uh, 41 uh, seeks to capture. And so we're going to have um, some muscle memory to develop. And what we seek to do is to develop in a collaborative fashion uh, with uh, the private sector. I will say uh, one thing uh, as well. Um, the, the statutory framework it is, as it exists now protects a company and an uh, individual uh, when the company or individual shares information with the government in terms of the privacy interests uh, that are implicated. One, of course, has uh, a, um, a coterie of regulators that one must uh, also uh, be mindful of. And here is where I may actually part a uh, company a little bit uh, from some of the regulatory activity that is taking place uh, in the enforcement uh, space. As a prosecutor, uh, as prosecutors, we knew very well um, what the standard of care was. Uh, the line was uh, quite clearly drawn between what you can do and what you can't do. And quite frankly, if it was gray uh, at all, uh, we would uh, probably leave it uh, to our uh, civil uh, enforcement colleagues uh, to address if appropriate, but in the criminal arena, it's, it's pretty clear that the line, is, the line is drawn. Here, here it's a little, um, uh, the, the, the sequence of events seems to throw me off from a policy perspective, and I'll just be very, uh, very frank. Um, it seems odd that the standard of care is not clearly defined, and we're actually defining it in the crucible of the courtroom uh, with impositions of liability. And, um, and it's through those impositions of liability that we are accumulating uh, a standard of care. And it seems a bit uh, ad hoc. Um, I think there are cases where uh, deficient care can be quite clear, uh, where there may, there may have been a do nothing uh, approach. Uh, but if one takes a look at the framework, the criteria that we use to address what our security system should be, the NIST framework uh, that is housed in the Department of Commerce. There are criteria, uh, there are guidelines, there is a framework once again, but there's not a clear line drawn as to what a large multinational corporation uh, should do, uh, vice a small uh, proprietorship. And um, I think we have to be uh, thoughtful uh, about that and really uh, discuss that as a community, as a public uh, private community. I hear in that community a great clamor uh, for greater uh, regulatory and legislative guidance and regulatory and legislative protections. And there I would say be careful what you wish for. Um, <clears throat> and it's not because you may not get what you want. You may actually get something that's counterproductive. 
I, I'm not really thinking about that. I'm thinking about um, a chasm between uh, the regulatory and um, statutory machinery and the dynamism of a cybersecurity landscape. Uh, specifically, the cybersecurity landscape is changing every day, if not every moment. If one describes our ability to promulgate statutes and regulations as nimble, one does not have any idea of how government is working <laughs> and will probably work tomorrow. And what I worry about is the protection that we promulgate today may be outdated uh, very, very quickly. And so I would actually um, advocate from my perspective of what I've seen to um, a, a more of a policy uh, guiding uh, landscape that we can actually calibrate and recalibrate uh, as we learn more. And if we do that as a government unilaterally because we think we know best, uh, then uh, I think we're not serving uh, the public and, and all of you and those whom you uh, represent uh, very ably. And so uh, a long way uh, of saying that this really requires um, a community uh, approach. Um, uh, my uh, distinguished colleague, Jeanette Manfra, uh, one of our cybersecurity specialists in the Department of Homeland Security, we were talking yesterday in my, in my office, just um, uh, ruminating uh, on, these, on these things, and she said, you know, it's like a 21st century neighborhood watch. And I think that's just a great, um, uh, that's a, a, a great image. And um, we want to be uh, part of that uh, neighborhood uh, as a participant in the sharing of information, uh, as a participant in devising a policy guidance that actually serves uh, shared goals and working very collaborative, collaboratively uh, with all of you. So thanks very much for uh, giving me the chance to share those thoughts and uh, hope you find the day uh, very fulfilling and enriching. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, uh, Ali. That was uh, a great kickoff for uh, what we're going to be talking about all day uh, and hopefully continue talking about as we move forward. Um, I think the, the overarching theme of uh, shared responsibility and, and working together is, is really the key thing to keep uh, in the front of your minds. Um, and we are we're here because we want to uh, understand better from you uh, how we can create an environment which is even more conducive to, to it than we may be uh, in right now. So moving now to our, uh, our first panel, um, which I will introduce and then attempt to lightly moderate, uh, although this group doesn't really need any moderation except maybe John Carlin. Um, those of you who... Uh, is John here before I invoke his name? He's not. All right, I'll save him. I'll introduce him at the end. I, I suspect he's he's in the, he's in the building. He's been cited. All right. Well, let me let me start then with uh, Suzanne Spaulding, who I can see right here, uh, who is uh, going to be uh, one of our panelists uh, talking about um, the new presidential uh, policy directive 41 and and basically roles across the interagency, in particular what. Uh, DHS does and how we work and play well with others, which is, I think, our specialty. Um, Suzanne uh, is, as I think most, if not all, of you know, the Undersecretary for what we currently call the National Protection and Programs Directorate. Um, we're working on getting a, a sexier name for that, something with cyber in it, uh, at the Homeland Security Department. Um, in that role, she oversees and coordinates the operational and policy functions uh, of MPPD's subcomponents, which includes, uh, of significance for today, the Office of Cybersecurity and Communications. But she also is responsible for things like infra infrastructure protection, biometric identity management, cyber and infrastructure analysis, 
and the Federal Protective Service. So she, she straddles the cyber and physical worlds, uh, which is actually an important uh, thing, which I, I suspect she will talk a little bit about. Um, Suzanne has a, an extended bio, which is in your material, so I'm not going to go through it all, but she has a distinguished career of more than 25 years working on national security issues um, in a bipartisan way uh, in Congress and in other places, and, and uh, we at the department have just been uh, really fortunate uh, for her leadership in this space. Um, next, I'd... Uh, introduced uh, David Johnson from uh, the FBI. Uh, David is the Associate Executive Assistant Director for Criminal Cyber Response, uh, Criminal Cyber Response and Services Branch. And I will tell you briefly about uh, David's background. Again, the details are in the, uh, in the handouts. Um, but in his current role, he supports the FBI's cyber and criminal investigations uh, international operations, critical incident response, victim assistance. He oversees FBI's development of cyber policy and strategy and serves as the Bureau's operational lead uh, of the Five Eyes Law Enforcement Group, which is an international coalition of law enforcement agencies from the U.S., the U.K., Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. Um, and he has uh, had a distinguished career in the FBI dating back to 1991 when he in the San Jose Resident Agency, the San Francisco Division. Uh, and then finally, um, John Carlin, who is, is actually now in the room, not just in the, in the house. Um, very glad to get John during his final days uh, in the Justice Department. Um, those of you who, uh, and, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, he's not getting fired. Um, <laughs> Those of you who know, uh, read the papers, know that, that John uh, just announced in the last day or two that he will be leaving the Justice Department in a couple weeks to pursue um, the public-private partnership, perhaps from a different perspective. Um, but uh, John and I go way back. Uh, his career in the Justice Department um, includes um, uh, just a... a uh, incredible uh, combination of experiences, but uh, which I'm not going to recount in detail, but let me just tell you briefly what he currently does. Um, he is the Senate-confirmed Assistant Attorney General for the National Security Division, um, and in that role, he is the Department of Justice uh, top national security attorney. Uh, he oversees about 400 employees who are responsible for protecting the country against international and domestic terrorism, espionage, cyber, and other national security threats. Um, and under his leadership, uh, NSD has uh, prosecuted the Boston Marathon bombing cases and uh, overseen uh, multiple terrorist uh, uh, investigations and uh, responses to various threats. And of particular relevance here, um, he oversaw the investigation of the attack on Sony uh, and their computer systems and uh, was instrumental, I think, in, in providing leadership in the indictment of the five members of the Chinese military for economic espionage, among many other things. Um, and uh, I will say that uh, I, on a personal note, um, we will miss John. He's been a terrific uh, public servant and uh, uh, defender of this country, but also a great partner uh, for the Homeland Security Department and, and sort of a bridge between our two worlds. And uh, we wish him all the best. So with, with those introductions, let me ask Suzanne, David, and John to come up and join me for a panel discussion. Uh, give them a round of applause. So our assigned topic uh, is the new presidential protective uh, presidential policy directive PPD 41, um, but it's uh, it's really a, um, a a broader conversation I think about the way in particular the Justice Department and uh, the Homeland Security Department and in particular various components thereof um, work together. 
uh, the, the structure that this new PPD 41 puts around that, which is sort of codifying, I think, kind of best practices, good things that we've already been doing. Um, and uh, I, I'm going to turn to these folks in a second to, to get into uh, some of the specific experiences that they've got and, and thoughts that they've got in this area. Um, I just want to make a couple points, sort of the level set for the audience. And some of you may be familiar with this new uh, PPD, and, and, and some perhaps uh, haven't had a chance to commit it to memory. Um, it, it came out, it was, it was uh, promulgated on July 26th of 2016, so it's uh, just barely two months old. And it governs uh, coordination uh, across the federal government, or it's really the national coordination strategy for significant uh, cyber incidents. So a, a lot of it is, is focused on an architecture of, of cooperation uh, for significant events, which are, are incidents that implicate national security or um, the economy or foreign relations or um, public confidence and, uh, in, a, in a substantial way that, that, that merits uh, sort of the, the most serious attention. Uh, sort of in, in, in contrast to kind of steady state uh, events that, that are always ongoing. But I think it's, it's important to point out that the PPD uh, also includes five uh, principles which govern uh, our national response to any cyber incident. And, and it's those five principles I just want to note at the outset, and I think we'll kind of be referring back to them uh, during the conversation. Um, and Personally, I, I think they're, they're good principles to live by. Um, the, first, the first of the, of the key principles here, let me get my, my old-fashioned notes here. Um, first principle one is one of shared responsibility. We've already had some references to that. In this space, um, the private sector, the, those of us in the public sector, have a shared vital interest. Um, it, it may be a little bit like a, a neighborhood watch uh, scenario uh, in some situations. It may be more like a, uh, an epidemic, uh, an, a disease. In fact, we use the vocabulary of, of, uh, of health sometimes, talking about cyber, viruses, infections, quarantines, things like that. Um, but I think it's, it's key, and the reason we're having this event is we want to engage uh, more deeply with the private sector uh, and, and have a conversation about how to execute on that principle. I think it's fundamental to, to, to our approach here. And, and I think the role of lawyers in this, uh, uh, with respect to this principle is critical. Lawyers as facilitators, um, as a sophisticated uh, subset of the private uh, sector who can hopefully articulate to their clients um, a, a, a space in which information sharing is legally permissible and, and uh, also um, sort of focus on the shared vital interest, both the short term and the long term. Um, so it, we'll, we'll talk a little more about that. But I, I, think, I think this group and uh, the bar generally um, has a critical role in building trust, which is the foundation for the private and, and public uh, partnership, building relationships, maintaining relationships. Um, and so I'm, uh, I'm particularly glad that, that you're all here. Um, the second uh, principle is that the national strategy is a risk-based response. The federal government will be factoring into it, it, the, amount, the resources that it devotes and, and the way it responds based on its assessment of how critical uh, the, the risk presented by the incident. The third is uh, that uh, the government will respect affected entities. We will we will treat victims like victims. Uh, and I will say that that is a, it's a particularly uh, sort of core principle for the Department of Homeland Security. We really see ourselves as, uh, as trying to uh, help people who have been victimized or prevent them from being victimized. Uh, the fourth is that um, we're committed to a unity of government effort um, in the same way we are in other areas like counterterrorism and uh, and then in, in answer to the, the kind of ghostbuster question, who are you going to call? Um, notice to one is notice to all. Um, and uh, we, we've got some channels that I think have been clarified, but I, I think uh, for purposes of this group, I think the key takeaway is that notice to one is notice to all. And then the fifth principle is um, that we're committed to enabling restoration and recovery in the wake of an incident. 
Um, uh, again, I think that, that the asset response piece of this is um, something that DHS takes a, a focus uh, lead on, but it's something that the Justice Department is also very committed to and has been doing historically and, uh, and, and will continue to work together. Balancing the investigative and national security uh, imperatives against the, the very important need to get a victim up and running again, recover, and, and mitigate uh, the spread of any harm, both within the, the, uh, the affected entity and, and having it not spread to others. Um, and, and so, so the two kind of core lines of effort in responding to an incident are the threat response and the asset response. Um, and so let me, let me turn first to our friends from the Justice Department, uh, FBI. I, I'll start with John and then maybe we can move to David. Um, we could talk a little bit about what the threat response looks like in practice. What, is that, what does that mean? Translate that into English for us. Good. And uh, thanks for having me here this morning. Uh, and just for your words of welcome, Steve. Uh, I remember uh, I think it was around 15 years ago when Steve was at the U.S. Attorney's Office in D.C. And at that point, I was specializing in digital evidence. But Steve brought me over to uh, start this new computer hacking intellectual property program in, uh, in district court, uh, court because he thought for some reason that computer hacking was going to be the wave of the the wave of the future. So he also looked like he was about 14. I figured he would. <laughs> Take to it quickly. The, uh, I, I just want, as we have a lot of lawyers here, distinguished from in-house and the private sector, so I wanted to make sure you have your pencils up for a moment, a practice point on PPD 41, which is, here's what you need to take back. Nothing. There's nothing in that presidential directive, <laughs> I think, that as a, as a lawyer advising a client. You always tell the guys that are about to leave the government. <laughs> We're going to kick back and tell it how it is today. But it, it, the reason for that is that really had to do more with codifying our best practices inside government. And to get to the threat response, here's how it's going to hit you. And let's, let's use Sony a little bit as an example because I think our government response to that incident uh, in many ways is then codifies, we codified in PPD 41 what we did right and hopefully not what we did, uh, what we can improve on. So you're advising a client or it's your client and you find uh, through your information technology folks that someone's inside your system. And not only are they inside your system, let's, uh, I'll give, give two variations of this. They're committing a destructive attack. Who are you gonna call and who do you know in government by name and by face today that you would call or that your client could call when your entire brand of a Fortune 100 company is on the line. If you don't, a face does not immediately spring to mind, then you don't currently have an adequate critical response plan. It moves too fast. Sony did. And so what they were able to do, Sony Pictures, is respond immediately and get the FBI on scene, get the Justice Department on scene. That allowed us to work with Homeland Security and the rest of the alphabet uh, soup which would be National Security Agency and others. The reason why that's so important in today's threat environment is unfortunately our companies are on the front line of a range of national security threats ranging from terrorist groups to nation state actors to sophisticated crooks. And when you're dealing with that response, you have a range of stakeholders and you're gonna need uh, to provide them comfort. So the FBI could provide comfort to employees about whether or not they're gonna further be uh, targeted. Executives at Sony wanted to know what's the president going to say about it and wanted people who are going to be privy to the National Security Council Situation Room uh, deliberations. They also wanted our help. It was one of the only times uh, in a, a uh, justice experience that I went out and did the kind of Wolf Blitzer tour, for which I blame North Korea, as did my counterpart at FBI. And we did that in order to say what happened to Sony could have happened to 90% of the Fortune 500 companies. It wasn't their fault. What we need to focus on is who did it and hold them accountable. The other thing that happened with Sony inside the uh, Situation Room, many of the people uh, in this room from government, we've spent years and years and years of wargaming out what it would look like if a rogue, nuclear-armed nation state decided to attack the United States through cyber means. And not once did we aim out that that would happen because of a movie about a bunch of uh, pot smokers. And I can tell you it's the only time in my career tried to brief the president on a national security threat and go in and 
start with trying to give a synopsis of the plot um, that had put us in that, and I don't know how many of you have seen it, but that is not easy, that is not easy to do. But we took it seriously as a national security threat, and why? Well, the reason why, sitting around the table we did that, was because it wasn't just to send a message to North Korea, a nation state that's notoriously difficult to govern their behavior, but to all the other countries in the world who are trying to figure out, and some non-state actors, what can we get away with in cyberspace? Is what we do in cyberspace so difficult to detect that it will always be anonymous? If they can detect what they do, are they really gonna do anything in response? So as we sat around the situation room, the two voices in the room who tried to give uh, a sense of what the victim's perspective were, were justice and homeland security. And that's because that's our role, uh, I think, around that, around that table. We're uniquely tasked with keeping in mind what the victim's perspective is. And in order to do that effectively, that means having contact with you. Um, so we know the full range of business and other concerns that you have. So as that conversation uh, ensued and we made the decision we need to do something fast, a couple other things had to happen. One, and this is uh, Dave Hickton will talk to you later, the US uh, attorney out in Pennsylvania. But we were able to apply an approach, and this was a, a change in approach, a fundamental shift which was number one, starting with the, the indictment of the five members of the People's Liberation Army, Unit 61398, to do the investigation and attribution, uh, which we knew, FBI and others, once we shared what had formerly only been treated as an intelligence problem with law enforcement could do, which is figure out who did it. So to those who thought it was anonymous, they were wrong. And those of us who had been privy to secret and top secret information had known that for years, but we weren't saying it. So step two was figure out who did it and then say it publicly. And then three was impose a consequence. Make sure that, uh, and in that case, the consequence came in the form of a criminal indictment. So we had tried this before. When it came to Sony, we were able to do the investigation and attribution because of how fast Sony cooperated and shared information. That allowed us uh, to have sufficient confidence using evidence that we could make public that it was North Korea to have in less than 28 days after the incident occurred a public announcement. From the point of view of the private sector, from Sony, the ability to say that it was North Korea and have the government say it publicly changed the narrative. And instead of the story being, what did the victim do wrong, let's blame the victim, as soon as we said it was North Korea, the media changed and said, hey, government, what are you gonna do? It, it's outrageous that North Korea can attack a US company. It's not a fair fight. Companies shouldn't have to defend themselves alone against nation states. And it should be, that burden should be on us. And then the third thing that we did in that instance was, uh, and this took getting uh, the intelligence community together to give an assessment. And in that case, we did it ad hoc through FBI. And one of the things this PPD does is set up a structure within government so we'll have a consensus view, the Threat Intelligence Center. But the third uh, thing we did was impose a consequence. And in that case, in addition to being, being public, there was also sanctioning that occurred of North Korea. However, we realized around the table, in some senses, we were lucky that it was Sony uh, and that it, the attacker had been North Korea because if it was another country that did a cyber attack or if the motive had been economic espionage, unlike terrorists, unlike those who proliferate in weapons of mass destruction, we didn't have any executive order that we could point to. That's why last year the president signed a new executive order that allows, and this is significant uh, for those in the private sector, that allows not just the sanctioning of those who commit the activity, um, so that might be the five members of the, of the PLA or others, but also allows the sanctioning of those who benefit from the stolen trade secret or business negotiation strategy. So for those who are considering why come forward, why share information, the answer is those who are stealing your trade secrets, those who are stealing things like the design specifications for lead pipes or the pricing informations from a uh, solar company, can't profit from what they took from you. The same rationale that's led us to bring economic espionage cases for, uh, for years. The other part of the partnership that I know uh, Suzanne will talk about as well is by sharing the information and figuring out what the vulnerability uh, was. In that case, Department of Homeland Security was able to put out a warning that allowed other companies who are going to be next on the list that North Korea had targeted, those who would distribute the film, to get the, uh, the code that they would need to protect their systems against the attack that was going to come. And for lawyers, I do think we're moving to a new world, and I'll stop here, but a new world where there's going to be liability if you don't share. 
think right now there's a discounting of the risk. You focus, uh, there's a tendency to focus on all of the downside risks of sharing. I want to have more control. I want to have more understanding of what happened. So I think I'll wait, maybe months, maybe years, maybe post a merger in order to disclose what's, uh, what's occurred. Huge potential downside risk, including at some point theories of liability that say because you sat on a vulnerability, that allowed other people to be harmed. The other part of that is an individual named Farisi. He was just sentenced to 20 years last week. But when you're sitting alone, uh, viewing it only from the lens of being the victim, it may look to you, this is a case of someone who hacked a retailer, um, stole personally identifiable information, and then tried to blackmail them for 500 bucks. It may look to you, as that would to many of us, like a small-scale criminal intrusion, you can pay 500 bucks, no big deal. But as it turned out, in that case, on the other end was not a crook. It was a terrorist. And what he did was he didn't just try to get 500 bucks. He used the stolen information to provide it to the Islamic State in the Levant, who culled through that information to create a kill list of government employees, uh, those in government and those in the military, that then using Twitter, he sent back to the United States with a specific call to kill them where they live in their homes. Because, in this case, the company did the right thing, we were able to arrest this guy, Kosovo extremist who'd moved to Malaysia in Malaysia, bring him to Eastern District of Virginia, where he's just got sentenced to 20 years, and the military was able to take effective action against Junaid Hussein in Raqqa, Syria, this British citizen where he was staying in Raqqa, Syria, outside the reach of law enforcement, and he was killed in a military strike. It is, unfortunately, a complicated threat environment that we face now. And you, for the first time, are on the front lines of national security threats because we've put things in digital form that you haven't been before. That puts a premium on our ability to work with you together to protect against those threats. I mean, that's a, that example you give is a, is a terrific illustration of how you don't know what you're receiving. And, that's, and that can only be uh, figured out when you put all the pieces of the puzzle together. Let me, let me ask uh, David on behalf of the, the Bureau to talk a little bit about the challenges that, that you guys face when you're responding to a, in a threat response mode. Yeah, uh, again, thank you for the opportunity for me to be here to, t to talk to you a little bit about PBD and the FBI and all the good work that everybody up here on the panel is, is doing. So um, let me give you the down at the Barbary uh, summary of uh, PPD 41, right? So um, we have heard a lot, government has heard a lot of um, concerns and issues from the private sector over time about roles and responsibilities and who is doing what. And that is one of the impetuses for, um, that led to PPD 41. So that particular document basically creates three lines of um, uh, activity, for lack of a better way to put it. So there is threat response, there is asset response, and then there is intelligence support. And then that document also articulates who's going to be responsible for what. So the FBI is going to handle threat response, DHS is going to handle the asset response piece, and then uh, a entity called CTIC, Cyber Threat Intelligence Integration Center, which sits out at ODNI, is responsible for developing the overall threat picture um, for uh, you know, cyber incidents. Um, and uh, so that defines the lanes in the road. Uh, and I'll take, talk to you a little bit about what threat response looks like from the FBI and what you can expect when the FBI shows up uh, on your door. So threat response is basically um, law enforcement activity that you would normally expect the FBI or any law enforcement agency to do, right? So it's um, conducting interviews, it's developing leads, it's conducting um, intelligence collection, disruption strategies, what you would normally expect. Uh, and when we show up uh, on, at your door, um, that's what you should expect. And as John said, the real key point there is uh, the pre-existing relationship with the FBI. So you've got to have that pre-existing relationship. Um, don't wait until something happens to develop it. Your local FBI field office uh, is actively out there trying to engage with all of the relevant corporations and companies uh, in the private sector uh, to identify those points of contact. But if you don't feel comfortable uh, with where you're at in that regard, 
I would say go ahead and reach out to your local FBI field office and develop that points of point of contact. And then moving forward with that contact, right, it's not a once and done. It's got to be an ongoing relationship, pushing the envelope, having those conversations with uh, your FBI folks um, so that when something happens, you've already got it and, and, and you're squared away and ready to go. Um, one of the other principles that is really important, and John alluded to it uh, too, that comes out of the document is um, sort of the collaboration uh, between all of the agencies that are going to be uh, responding and working on this. Uh, we say a call to one is a call to all, uh, and I think we heard something similar to that. So the actual document says if, if one federal agency finds out about a particular cyber incident, they are obligated to let the other federal agency, relevant federal agencies to know about that. So from an FBI perspective, we are not saying, hey, you've got to call the FBI to report uh, a cyber incident. You don't. You just call whoever you're most comfortable with within the federal government, whether it's DHS, whether it's Secret Service, whether it's the FBI, that's good enough, that's fine. And then the responsibility will be on those agencies to uh, get the word out so that we can unify our, our response. Um, and I think I'm going to stop, stop right there. But again, I think the, the real takeaway for uh, the folks in the room is, yeah, get to know either your FBI uh, field office or somebody from DHS or Secret Service so that when you need to make a call, you can, and it's not an issue. Yeah, that's a very well put. Let, let me ask Suzanne to talk about where the Homeland Security Department sort of fits into the, the mosaic here and, and what asset response really is. So DHS under this document outlining how the federal government is organizing around this um, has the lead for asset response. Uh, and that means that there may be others involved in asset response as well. And our responsibility in that case is to help coordinate all of those activities. And that involves the technical assistance to the victim. So uh, my assistant secretary for cybersecurity, Andy Osmet, likes to use the uh, metaphor of, a, of an arson, right? Uh, uh, you know, you've got a fire raging. Uh, we are the firefighters coming in to put out the fire. Our focus is on, you know, figure out what's causing this fire, stop it, mitigate the damage, uh, and while at the same time, and this is one of the fundamental principles of PPD 41, is concurrent response activities. Um, you've got your, your law enforcement folks coming in to figure out, you know, who's behind this arson, who started this fire, and how can we prevent, you know, other victims of this. And so we work together looking at what we find as we go in to help companies on a purely voluntary basis and provide technical assistance to them to kick the bad actor off, to secure their systems and to rebuild more securely um, in collaboration with the work that the law enforcement is doing. Where are potential future victims here? Uh, and what is the information that we can get to them as quickly as possible uh, to try to prevent them from, from falling prey to the same kind of malicious activity? So that is at the heart of what we are doing. And um, as has been pointed out, we will often get notice of an incident through the FBI because they will have been contacted, but not always. Um, uh, uh, it will sometimes come through our field uh, folks, protective security advisors who work with critical infrastructure owners and operators and private sector companies all across the country every single day and have been working with them for many years on their security posture, um, a primarily physical but increasingly cyber. We also have cybersecurity advisors uh, all across the country, not as many of them, not even close to as many of them as we need, and we're building those ranks, um, but who also are doing the same thing, working with our uh, private sector folks across the country. So we will often get, uh, they will get a call because they're the folks that, that the um, uh, company is comfortable with, and they know they can help put them in touch with the whole of government response that is required. We'll also get uh, information about incidents sometimes through ISACs, the Information Sharing and Analysis Centers. Uh, and, and so there are a number of ways in which information might come into us uh, through to the NCIC, which is our 24 by 7 operation center. It stands for National Cybersecurity Communications Integration Center. Um, and they are often the intake for getting information about incidents. And uh, we, when we 
respond to that, the first thing we do is to, is to work out a, a request for technical assistance so that the company is very comfortable with what are, what are we coming in and doing, right? So again, it's purely voluntary. Uh, the private sector company and the general counsels of those companies are comfortable with what it is that we're gonna come in and do, and most of the time we don't put hands on keyboards. Most of the time we come in and we direct, we help work with your uh, IT staff, uh, assuming you've got one, uh, to, to, to very quickly, uh, as we say, put out this fire and prevent further damage. Um, and, and then the information that we glean and we put out for others is anonymous. We can do that without any reference to the victim or that specific incident. But we, what we want to get out is the kind of technical network defense information that other uh, IT folks can put in place in CISOs to protect their networks. And one of the ways we do that, of course, is, is in an automated way, automated information sharing. And so we can get that information and, uh, and get it out in near real time to a whole network of networks uh, of folks who are in a position to receive that information at machine speed. And that's really where we need to get. We really need to, to, to get uh, much, much faster in sharing this, uh, this threat information. So uh, that sounds great from one perspective, but I know there's another perspective that sort of gets scared when you talk about machines sharing massive amounts of data in real, near real time. Um, what can you say about the, the privacy protections, the, uh, the other kinds of concerns that um, folks in the private sector might have about that, that model that we're moving towards? Right. So one of the things that, uh, that I am really most proud of at the Department of Homeland Security is that we have what I think was, was I know was the first and maybe still the only statutory uh, privacy protection office. Uh, and some of our privacy uh, folks are here today. Uh, and, they, and I have my own privacy officer in the NPPD. And they are part and parcel of our programs as we build technologies, programs, tools, uh, from day one, and they are very much a part of the team. And so there are privacy impact assessments of all of our programs uh, uh, that we undertake and our tools and those activities. Um, you can find them posted online. They tell you what we're doing, why we're doing, what we do with the information. So that's a very important part uh, and part. So what we also, as I say, when we do this uh, automated information sharing, it is anonymous. And so there are, there are privacy filters built in to make sure that, that information that is, does not uh, relate to specific threat indicators is not included, is filtered out. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a filtering out at the front end when the information is entered into this structured format. There's a filtering that takes place at DHS uh, before it goes out. And the information goes out in a way that is anonymous. And then there are follow-up audits on a regular basis. So we take privacy very seriously. It's the coin of the realm for us. We, I, I emphasized over and over what we do is voluntary. And if we don't have the trust of the private sector and the American public, we can't do our job. That's great. Let me ask, uh, let me ask David to talk a little bit about a, a, a particular uh, sort of phenomena that I think is, is uh, uh, certainly on the rise and, and a cause of great concern, and that's ransomware. Um, and maybe just talk a little bit about how the federal response, uh, what the federal response is to ransomware and sort of how that sort of fits within this framework that we're talking about. Yeah, so w with regard to the framework. Start with what it is, man. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, ransomware. It's malware that infects computers, networks, and services. And basically what it does is it, it, it encrypts uh, information on the user's computer or networks, right? And then you've got to pay a ransom, usually in Bitcoin, to get access back to that information. Um, and uh, with regard to the response of ransomware, what I, what I would say is that, um, so PPD41 applies to significant cyber incidents. So it doesn't necessarily apply to every incident. However, what I will say is that the framework that is laid out really should apply to just about every cyber incident that we respond to in some 
shape or form because I think it really does, uh, it is based in logic, it makes sense, uh, and it really allows um, for each agency to contribute to uh, resolving uh, the particular incident. So with regard to ransomware, um, I can give you all kinds of facts about CryptoWall 3.0 is the newest variant. Um, uh, we see this continuing sort of evolution uh, of the malware. Most of the money uh, that is paid ends up in banks, either in Hong Kong or China. And we've seen some really significant uh, increases with regard to ransomware, uh, particularly over the last couple of years. And the victims kind of across the board, but lately they seem to have been a lot, um, a lot of hospitals. So there doesn't seem to be a lot of um, uh, poor discretion on the part of the, the subjects, right, in terms of who the victims are. So um, having said that, so the FBI, uh, again, will handle uh, that threat response. And we will go out and we will conduct the investigation and we will try and um, uh, figure out who did it. It comes back to attribution for us, and if we can impose costs, that's exactly what we'll do, depending on where the subjects are. And if we cannot put our hands on them, then we will um, engage in uh, what we refer to as a name and shame campaign, um, because that makes a difference as well um, uh, for a variety of different reasons. So that's what you get from the threat response, but also with regard to the asset response, as Suzanne was uh, mentioning, so we've got to be working together, right, in terms of uh, what we do from a threat response capacity, what we figure out and find out, and we've got to make sure that DHS knows about that uh, so they can do their part, and we also have to let uh, CTIC know about what we're seeing too so that the broader message can get pushed out uh, to the community at large so that the um, USG is just better educated and we in turn can better educate the private sector so that you, the private sector, can protect yourselves moving forward. Let me just ask Suzanne to uh, sort of, from the DHS perspective, what, what do you uh, do, what do you counsel with respect to ra ransomware? So I want to pick up on, on Dave's uh, final point there because we've talked a lot about the government, PPD 41 is primarily telling you how the government is organizing. But one of the most important pieces of PPD 41 was the direction from the president to develop the National Cybersecurity Incident Response Plan, and DHS has been leading that effort, and it actually started prior to the PPD even being issued. And that is really important because that is where we really bring in the private sector. The private sector is a key player here. John said it's not fair to ask the private sector to all by itself uh, deal with threats from very sophisticated, including nation state actors. And of course, what I hope you're hearing here is that you're not alone in this. We are here to help you. We're from the government and we're here to help, uh, but we really are. Um, but, but it is also true that we will be best positioned to help you if we have already talked about what role you're going to play. And you have a very important role to play in the private sector, whether it's, uh, you know, the things that you can do in advance to prepare for ransomware, such as making sure you have backed up your systems, uh, but, all, but, but much more broadly in terms of what the role of the private sector will be and understanding what each of us brings to the table in terms of our comparative advantage for dealing with this threat, right? The reason that we, we are uh, responsible for locking our doors in our homes, even as we have law enforcement that is responsible for going after the criminals and doing their part to keep our neighborhoods safe, is that we're, we have the comparative advantage with respect to locking our doors. There are things that the private sector must do, but also be prepared in terms of responding and, and, and being able to uh, have audit logs and enable forensics, uh, not, not, being, uh, call, not, not dealing for the very first time with responders when they show up at your door. So we brought in the private sector uh, back in early spring to begin preparing for this because we knew it was coming. Uh, and when the PPD was signed in June or July, July, I guess, uh, uh, we hit the ground running and it's now being circulated uh, uh, for comment. And I think, I'm not sure whether it's gone for public comment yet, but it will in the next few days. Uh, and a very important piece of that. So we've talked a lot about the government, the private sector role is critical here. I, I believe there's a 180 day clock from the date of the PPD. So that would take us from the end of July, presumably into early 2017 when this plan would come out. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. 
John, do you have any thoughts about ransomware or anything else that keeps you up at night? Well, uh, the, with ransomware, one thing that encourages you to think about it and how it might affect both you in your law firm, um, but also with your uh, clients, is it's, it's not just ransomware, it's, it's a very similar threat. So ransomware would be, you know, you try to access certain files and suddenly you can't access them. And someone says, pay me money if you want to see them again. But there are other types of extortion that take place through cyber threats, whether it's that Farisi model that I talked about where someone, in that case, threatened just to embarrass the company by doxing, by releasing the information about the fact that he had stolen the personal identifiable information uh, to um, a, a similar, uh, similar versions of that type of extortion where maybe it should be they embarrass you by, by letting people know that they got into your system. What we saw for a period of time, like early mafia, was that everyone was handling it on their own and, no, and not talking to uh, government. And there are probably a couple of reasons uh, for that. Right? One is it seemed like if I just pay them off, they'll go away, and so that's going to be the lower risk for the company. And there, again, I want to uh, think about a different way that as lawyers you can think about how that might not pay off. So one is the example I gave you of Farisi where you, just as good citizens, wouldn't want to be paying off a terrorist group that's using your stolen information to kill fellow citizens and have their blood on your hands. But second, as a business, that would be game over for your brand. If, it, if you made the wrong risk calculation internally and not told anyone, and then later there's a terrorist attack using your stolen uh, information. Third, and this, this is a common scenario, um, there's a group uh, Syrian Electronic Army. And this is another one of those examples where for too long people thought we couldn't do the investigation attribution so there'd be no consequence. This is a group that spoofed a terrorist attack on the White House and caused the stock market to lose billions of dollars. Well, the person responsible for that is also in a jail cell now across the river having been arrested in Germany. But as it was laid out in our complaint, his group was being paid off regularly by corporations throughout the world. And it's because he was ex extorting them and they wouldn't have consciously paid off the Syrian electronic army, but they didn't know because we weren't able to put the, uh, put the information together. A fourth version of this, and I'll just go back to the uh, arson analogy. If you think about the fire and the police, there's another thing you want to know if you're the victim of an arson. We used to do the, uh, these cases. You want to know whether that fire was intentional um, and you, or whether it was it an accident. And why do you want to know? Well, one of the reasons you want to know is if the reason they came after you is, um, is because they have a, a beef with your company, so they're going to keep coming after you, then that's going to change the way you do your risk calculus, how much you spend on your defenses, and how you work with the government. And what we're seeing now is sometimes the chief um, risk factor for your company or your client is their public profile. That may be why the terrorist group wants to attack them. It may be why a nation state like uh, Iran wants to do a denial of service attack, or North Korea wants to launch against a movie uh, company. It may be the reason why Anonymous, uh, because they don't like something that your CEO or, or as a law firm, a client that you're representing wants to come after you or they want your competitive information. That is not technical um, information as we move towards sharing that in real time. It's technical information plus knowing who did what when in a way that requires us to actually talk about why they'd be in your system and doing the business. And that's the type of information we used to do a poor job in government of sharing back. And so one of the changes that we've been trying to work on across government, I know uh, particularly with the FBI, is to share with you here's who we think did it, and to be able to share with uh, your industry. Until we can share that back, you can't really adequately protect yourself against the threat. Okay, um, I would love to have this panel answer questions from this group. Um, are there any? Oh my goodness, okay. Um, do we have mics at the table here? All right, Ish, we just, Start over there, and we'll work across here. We have a gentleman here. Right? A gentleman all over, among others. Uh, what's your name? John. John. You said there may be liability if you do not share. 
Uh, now everybody in here wants to share. I heard that too. I was wondering whether someone asked about that. Everybody want in here wants to share information. That's why we're here. Uh, but excluding uh, required disclosures under securities laws and excluding any concerns that you might have with branding, where would you be liable uh, civilly or criminally for not disclosing a penetration or a hack or a threat or ransomware? That's a great uh, question. So in this area, um, unlike others uh, that we deal with, I think the particular risks are going to be very sector specific. So in some uh, instances, you may face additional liability or requirements because of how you're regulated and what your particular regulator for your sector is going to require. Then as you've alluded to, you're seeing SEC uh, change and start to increase its practices, first by testing and attempting to provide assistance and making sure that you have plans on the books. Um, and then next, I think they're going to do a regime of inspecting whether or not you do or don't and look to see whether you did not just proper disclosures, but whether you properly protected uh, your systems in the first instance. Then you have FTC who is uh, moving into this space. And I don't want to be uh, uh, cavalier, but the fact is, from our experience working on this, every single regulatory body within the government, federally and state, is trying to move as quickly as they can to having a bigger footprint in this area to improve defensive practices. And candidly, I, I'm not sure that that's, going, that's the right calibration, and we're probably going to have to recalibrate uh, at some point, but right now, if you're the private sector, that's the mindset and that's the temperament. I think it's in part because we moved very, very quickly over a 25 year period from putting almost everything we value from analog to digital space and then connecting it to the internet, but we did so without an adequate calculation of risk. So everyone, private side, federal side, is now playing catch up to what the risks are. Looking at um, another area of potential liability that was civil suit, and what you've seen now is we haven't regulated a standard of care. And you've seen um, in a variety of areas the administration say we don't intend to uh, have a federal legislated mandated standard of care. And one of the reasons is it's the threat is changing so very, very quickly. They don't think that this is an area where the government would be best at saying do, uh, do X that's sufficient or not sufficient. And we've heard the same thing from the private sector. Please don't, don't set one uh, standard fair. In fact, I used to hear that very, very clearly. And over the last uh, year or two, I'm starting to hear some come in and say, you know what, actually be good if we had one, one standard that we could fit. And you're seeing some, <laughs> some sectors, so we know that we've hit it and it's sufficient. But in the interim, then, just like you see in other areas of tort, you're going to see civil suits trying to figure out where that standard of care is. And you're starting to also see the insurance industry move into that space and also certain sector groups within the private uh, sector set for their sector. Here's an approved upon set of back best practices to give us uh, comfort. In terms of criminal liability, the one, one area uh, that I be concerned of as we see this threat change and we move towards that blended threat where it's, it looks both criminal and national security would be the potential of tripping up things like providing material support to a terrorist group where I do think if you take due care and you're talking to the government, it's absolutely not going to be a concern, but might be more of a concern if you attempted to handle it on your own. Or one more on the uh, liability, <laughs> but due diligence. I think you're just starting to, if, um, if someone who practiced in the white collar or criminal space uh, for a period of time, you will have reams of pages before a deal is done on Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, FCPA, and if you're in finance or other areas, on money laundering. The due diligence that you'll see, or uh, that I've seen some of these, it'll be one paragraph on cyber, and it'll essentially be, you know, did they, uh, is there some public incident that they've already reported? That's going to start I think spawning lawsuits post transaction, there's gonna be an expectation upon investors that that's part of your uh, due diligence. And when you miss a significant cyber uh, event is gonna spawn subsequent uh, litigation. Yeah, I, I, I agree on the due diligence. I've been talking to my 
colleagues, as I know you have, John, with the, in the American Bar Association for years about that. Um, I, you know, I would say while we, you know, before we get to a potential federal standard of care, um, I do think we can work on harmonizing regulatory approaches and certainly with regard to guidance that is given. We're seeing increasingly regulatory bodies at the state and federal level putting out guidance and I think we can do a better job of trying to harmonize that guidance so companies have a clearer sense of, of what to do. And the last thing I would say, if you're concerned about potential liability for failing to sh share information, sign up for automated information sharing. Um, this will be my plug for uh, the Congress uh, gave us a statutory basis for this uh, automated machine-to-machine -machine, uh, real-time sharing of cyber threat indicator information, technical, uh, technical indicators that can be used to protect networks. Uh, and you have uh, liability protection with regard to the sharing of that information. Uh, and that is explicit in statute. We promulgated guidance to help you understand exactly when that applies and how that applies. Um, but the first thing you need to do is to uh, go to our website, nkick.gov, and sign up uh, for AIS. So, I, uh, Gabe, it's us hyphen cert, yeah, .gov. Thank you. Next question. Um, what's come up, first of all, thank you all for being here today. Um, what a common theme that sort of came up across uh, this panel was the idea of if there is an incident or a compromise, we'll call it an incident, that comes up that in, in order to implement a whole government response, there's going to have to be some sort of assessment of that. What is the, I believe, Mr. Bundle, you said, what is the impact of this incident um, on the nation and so on? And as a matter of reality, we all know that the FBI can't work every single compromise that occurs and so on. Um, and and what, I, what I'm getting to here is that what that in essence seems to leave is that you almost have to make the cyber equivalent of a too big to fail list to warrant the full blown response that you're looking at here. And would that, is there a concern that what you then have is, uh, Mr. Carlin mentioned, the $500 case not getting the attention because it's only $500. And ironically, the companies most able to defend themselves, the Sonys of the world with all these, are the ones that get the most attention and some of the others might not be. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll ask Suzanne to talk to that, but I, I think for DHS, a lot of our resources are devoted to smaller, less sophisticated companies and not, you know, the Wall Street banks who are actually very sophisticated in this area. But Suzanne, is that? Yeah, that's, a, that's absolutely right. We, we, have, we feel a particular obligation to assist small and medium-sized businesses and working with the private sector to, to figure out how we can promote a market-driven response to the needs of small and medium-sized businesses, right? So scalable, affordable uh, ways in which the small and medium-sized businesses can address this, but also trying to move the market uh, to address those needs. But we do also need to do a risk management approach to the allocation of scarce resources. So you're absolutely right. And in terms of sort of a too big to fail list, um, I, I, don't, I don't think I would call it that. It's not about size, but it is about risk. And the president in the executive order on cybersecurity, 13636, asked DHS to create a list. Uh, it was in six, section nine of the executive order, so I call it the section nine list. And it is a, he asked us to see, are there entities where a successful cyber attack would have catastrophic consequences? And the answer is yes. Uh, there are probably fewer of them than you might imagine, but we worked with the critical infrastructure sectors, and it's uh, one of the ways in which our having both physical uh, critical infrastructure protection and cyber critical infrastructure protection under, our, under the same roof has helped us. We went to each of the sectors. We said, where could catastrophic consequences, where are there places in which there are sort of single points of failure where catastrophic consequences could result. Now, which of those could be caused by cyber? And this is the same risk management approach that I encourage private sector companies and my government colleagues to take. Um, not necessarily just focusing on catastrophic, but what are the consequences we care most about? Bring not just your IT people, but your program people, your marketing people, your lawyers, your risk uh, assessment officers to the table to say, what are, the, what, are, what are the things that could disrupt our business 
uh, that we really need to worry about. Now, turn to your IT people. Which of these could be caused by cyber? And that's how you prioritize your allocation of resources, right? And that's what the government is doing as well with respect to those high impact uh, uh, assets across the country. But let me say that as we work with those companies, and you're right, some of them are the most capable in the cybersecurity realm, what we are doing is, is getting, gaining information, insights, and best practices that we then promulgate across the entire sector to businesses of all sizes. Um, so that that effort is not just about protecting those assets, it is about working with those assets to protect everyone. I think we've got time for at least one more. Anybody have a mic? Uh, yeah. Thank you. I wanted to ask uh, John, I think you spoke about the Sony experience, which is really, I think, from the perspective of a company that has suffers a major uh, cyber attack, a good one, right? The government came out and attributed to an actor and kind of gave the cover and you did your morning news tour or whatever it was. I was involved in uh, another major incident which had a different response from the government, um, probably because it was a different foreign actor. Um, and while the government was willing to tell us who they thought it was, they were not willing to make public statements to that effect. There was some leaking to the Wall Street Journal, it you know, kind of got out, but the cover that we as a company would have appreciated from other regulators, hundreds of class actions, et cetera, did not arrive. And so we kept saying, well, how come they, Sony got it? Um, I wonder if you could talk to the fact, talk about the issues there. You know, you're the government, private companies, to some extent, your interests coincide, and to some extent, there are differences, diplomatic or, or otherwise, other factors that may influence that. No, I think that's a great uh, question. Let me, a uh, couple of things. One is, in instances that involve economic espionage, trade secrets, where the company is the victim, I do want to emphasize that at least uh, uh, for the National Security Division, if it's a nation state actor and it's economic espionage or trade secret, we're not going, if you come to us and say you've been a victim, we are not going to bring that case or public action if you tell us it will harm you as the victim. We are going to use the information for intelligence purposes. We may do a lot of follow-up calls trying to convince you to change your mind, but at the end of the day, we will not re-victimize uh, a victim if that's not what's best for your business model. And what I, would, I do think you're seeing now is people are recalculating and saying that's better. Second, when it comes to uh, doing investigation and attribution in a way that we make it public, this is a really new uh, approach for government. And we've moved extraordinary quickly in government time over the last uh, four or five years, but to give you some sense, we didn't have a program that did this at all at the end, beginning of 2013. We started a new program of hundreds of prosecutors trained across the country on bits and bytes and also on sensitive sources and method. The FBI issued an edict that said share intelligence that they hadn't previously shared and we began the conversation with the intelligence community about why it might make sense, even though it does cause, make it more difficult to collect why just watching this as an intelligence problem isn't gonna work because it's causing real harm to real companies now. So I'd be curious uh, to talk to you later or offline on it, but one thing is, and this is just, if you don't, we're trying through this uh, executive board to make sure we're sharing information across government. But I do think right now, if you don't know which door to go in, um, and, and uh, relationship to put, which is why I'm trying to be transparent about who does what, that you may get a different answer. Um, and, because it takes time uh, to go over the hump and having that conversation so that we know from the perspective of the victim's company at a high level why it's important to be public might be the difference when people are doing the cost benefit analysis of why should we go public. I think in some instances, the calculation will be, it's gonna cause some harm to a diplomatic uh, relationship. We're not sure if it'll cause the change in behavior so we don't see an upside. Having the victims come in, it has an enormous, you know, we've sat through some of these conversations. It changes the weight of the room to say, here's something you haven't thought of. 
for X, Y, or Z reason, it makes a real business uh, difference to this company. And it, it shifts, uh, but it shifts in those debates. You also have the economic or trade agencies. And uh, by and large, uh, the way government works, people try to represent the interests of their department or agency so you get the full picture. The trade agencies, the economic agencies, State Department will tend to say, we don't want to take a disruptive action because it might harm business or diplomatic relationships. Being able to say from the enforcement perspective, no, there's another way of looking at that. Our failure to do it is causing real business harm changes their position at the table. And they don't usually have that conversation with you or, um, or your clients. And so I think that's helped change the way that we are already uh, doing business, but will help going forward as well. Well, I think that's a, a great question to end on because it highlights the role of attorneys as advocates for their clients in helping the government make the right decision, which is uh, what I hope you all take away from here. If nothing else, we're going to take a 10-minute break um, and uh, reconvene at 11.15. Uh,